Good morning, friends. Neely's Creek Sunday School. It's very nice to see you again. This morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 18. There are so many things in this passage that are timely that just get to the very heart um, of the issues of our own hearts. And so I'm excited to look at this with you. Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for this time and this place that we are able to come together, even um, in a manner like this. Lord, our, we pray that you would just continue to knit our hearts together um, as your people, Lord, gathered around one thing, and that is you and your Son and your Spirit and how you have in your gracious plans brought us together as your people because of your son. Lord, we thank you again um, for your love for us, even displayed in this passage as a shepherd seeks out a lost sheep. Lord, I pray that you would uh, go before by your spirit and that you would work in the hearts of those that hear these words that to be your word, that you would work in uh, my heart and my mind, my mouth, as I uh, bring your word to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Matthew 18 is a rather long chapter. And so without waiting even for a moment, I think we just need to get right in to what's going on and then try to understand and comprehend and know uh, the great truths that are being uh, brought to us here by the pen of Matthew through the Holy Spirit. So beginning at verse 1, I just want to take some sections. I'm not going to read the entire chapter as I've done before, but I'll take it in sections. So chapter 18 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Well, first off, we have to talk about being like little children. There's some things about being a little child that we need to remember. And I had to re re refresh my memory of, even though I have little children at home, there are some external things about being a child. When you're a child, you don't, pay bills, you don't own land, you don't vote, you don't serve in the military, you don't have the same cares and responsibilities that you do as an adult, especially an adult with a, with a family, a father or a mother. And so there is a great difference between being an adult and a little child. One of the biggest things is that you are completely dependent on your parents. You are completely dependent on your father and your mother. Everything that you have is everything that they have. If they have a home, you have a home. If they do not have a home, you are homeless. If they are hungry, you are hungry. If they are well-fed, generally you are well-fed if you have loving, good parents. And so he is saying, Jesus here is saying, if you would like to enter my kingdom, you must be as this little child. And I think in that sense, very applicable, dependent on everything, dependent on the kingdom, depending on the good heavenly father who delights in giving good gifts. You're completely dependent on him. You're completely dependent on Jesus Christ, 
my uh, children at home, I think about the things that I enjoy doing. I think about my oldest son and my, and, uh, my middle son, Haddon and Piers, and I think about the things that I enjoy doing like fishing. They've begun to be interested uh, in those things now. Did they think of them? No, not really. They're interested in them. They enjoy doing them because daddy enjoys doing them. They enjoy being outside and going hiking and camping because daddy does them and mama does them. And there's a family closeness built around the activities of the family. In an even greater way, we, simp- we, we, we desire to exemplify the Christian life, to see mama and daddy reading their Bibles, to see mama and daddy praying at dinner, to see mama and daddy reading to their children, to see mama and daddy loving one another, showing them the Lord Jesus showing them that we are His, showing, him, showing them that we belong to His kingdom first and foremost. I think about the Apostle John and his relationship with Jesus. Uh, he's often called in John's gospel the, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. You see that even at the Last Supper, he's as close to Jesus as he can possibly get He's reclining right against him even at the Last Supper. And it's that close, almost like a child leaning against their parent as they eat a meal or read a book. Uh, There's this closeness that is needed when you consider yourself a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You become like a little child. It's a beautiful thought. Verse 6 then, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned into the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Your, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So beginning at verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, he qualifies this statement by saying, those who believe in me, defining the little ones. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck. Now stumbling is spoken about all the way back in Leviticus even. A stumbling block was something literal that you could you would put in you would leave out or you would put in front of someone's path that they would fall now by the time the gospels are written that stumbling block being a literal something a literal block or a big piece of wood had become something more along the lines of um, something that would cause people to sin something that would cause them to turn away from God. Your life, your instruction, your teaching could do this. And so Jesus is saying, if this is you and you cause my little ones to stumble, it would be better for you if he says a millstone were tied upon your neck and you were to be drowned. This is very serious. A millstone was not a small stone. 
was a huge stone. And that huge stone had a, uh, like a log or a milled piece of wood in the center. And then it would be attached to a donkey. And the donkey would walk around in a circle, causing this huge stone to roll in a basin. And it would be a stone that the entire town would use, a community would use to grind there and to mill their grain. And so it was a big, heavy stone. And many times, like I said, it, even a, it would cause it would cause a donkey difficult to, a difficult time to move. If that's tied around you and you're thrown into the lake, you're not coming back up. So causing these little ones to stumble, Jesus gives very, a very stern warning that this not be done. Verse 7, though, starts something that is, is almost complete, is, is not different, but it starts this little caveat. And it says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. So he backs up the lens of the camera. It's not just focused on, on one's that would cause these little ones to stumble in some very specific situation or place. But he says, woe to the world itself because of the things that cause people to stumble. The world itself. The world is not our friend. And Jesus acknowledges that here. Such things must come those things which cause people to stumble, difficult times, temptations. But woe to the person whom they come, by whom they come. When I think about this, I think about the story of Jesus' incarnation, his life, his being born and his life his death, his coming to save sinners. This was God's plan to save sinners, that he would come. He would die on their behalf and he would suffer as a man. These things were done but woe to such a person by who they come. If we were to look at Matthew's gospel turning to chapter 26, Jesus has already said many times that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified. But woe to the person through whom they come. I think of Judas Iscariot. Matthew 26 and verse 23, he says this. Read with me if you have your Bibles open. Matthew 26, verse 23. Verse 23 says, Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Jesus was going to the cross. But woe to that man who gave him over for 30 pieces of silver. It would be better for him that he had not even been born. I think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about, even in Matthew 18. So then we have to deal with this uh, passage that talks about 
entering the kingdom whole rather than without some part like a hand or a foot or an eye. And he says, it would be better for you to enter without one of these or without an eye. It would be better for you to enter than for you to be cast out whole or with them. He's saying, if your eye should cause you to stumble, if your foot by where you go should cause you to stumble, if your hand by what you do should cause you to stumble, then cut it off. It would be better for you to cut off your hand or your foot, as extreme as that would be, and for you to enter the kingdom of God whole than to be cast out. The Jews in this day thought that the resurrection or during the resurrection, you would be resurrected in whatever state in which you died. It's a common cultural belief. And I think he's playing to that and saying it would be better for you to be resurrected without a hand or a foot, even though in the resurrection of the righteous, you will be made whole again. The important thing is that you enter the kingdom and that you do not, you will, that you are not cast out into the fires of hell because of your sin. Very stern warnings from Jesus. And I, and I illustrate it and I think about it in these terms. If you were a slave on a ship, the slaves on a ship, especially the slaves on a rowing ship, they would be chained together in a row while they were rowing. And if that ship were to go down, many times the chains were not, the ship would go down before even the chains were loosed for those slaves, those prisoners who were rowing that ship and they would go down with the ship. Well, many times those prisoners would, they would relinquish a hand the hand that they were bound even, so that they would not go to the depths with the ship. And Jesus is saying, the ship of this world, it will not last. Second Peter says, there is a time coming when the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And this ship being this world, it will be judged by fire. And it would be better if you were to lose a hand to escape the wrath to come to enter his kingdom than for you to remain whole with all your limbs and your eyes and not escape the great and terrible day of the Lord which is coming. That is the wrath of God against all sin. We must be hidden in Christ, in God, as Paul says in Colossians from that day. There is only one place of refuge. It is not in the world. It is in Him, in His kingdom, where He is King and Lord of all. How does He illustrate His loving kindness for us and how does He illustrate His grace to us that He desires for us to be in His kingdom with Him? Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Talking about the children, talking about those who believe again. For I tell you that the angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier than about that one sheep than about the 99 that he did not that did not wander off in the same way your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish Jesus is the good shepherd he's watching his flock so he is the shepherd when one sheep wanders off. He goes and he searches and he carries it back in his arms. He's a good shepherd. 
In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. That is his desire. God is a loving and a good God, full of compassion. He desires that you would be with him in his kingdom. He does not desire that you would be cast out. He desires for you to be there so much that he would leave the 99 and go and pursue you into the wilderness that you may be brought back, that you may enter in with him. Second Peter chapter 3, I've alluded to that a minute ago, but let's look at it. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Let's begin at verse three. It says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. These waters also, by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the Lord says, there is a day coming when there are, the Lord will visit again. There will be a great day, a day of judgment and destruction for the ungodly. But the Lord is being patient. The Lord is beckoning for you to come, for you to enter in. The Lord is searching you out not willing that any of you should perish, for he is the good shepherd. Come to him. Heed his warning. His arms are outstretched. He loves you. He has gone to Jerusalem. He has set his face to Jerusalem. He has suffered and he has died as a man upon the cross only to be resurrected in newness of life. This he has done for his sheep. His sheep know his name. They know his voice. Come to him, follow him, enter in. Do not be found outside. That is where he desires you little children to be. So in the last section of chapter 18 is a very famous passage on dealing with sin in the church. There's two small points I would like to deal with in this section, even though it could be expanded to a, a far greater extent. But let's look at verses 15 through verses, verse 20 and then 21 through 35 and then we will be done for today. But verses 15 through 20 talk about sin in the church. And they say, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And then he continues on and says, if they listen, you have won them. But if they will not listen, take one or two 
others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, then treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done in heaven by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So, two things I want to mention here. So one thing, keep this section in mind with this previous section. God's loving kindness, his care for his little ones, his care that you enter in, his care that you not sin, that and will you will sin and that sin will keep you from entering in to his goodness and to his kingdom. Even taking the extremes of what we have dealt with before in the losing of a hand or an eye or a foot that you may enter in. Not let that sin reign in you. That sin leads you off. As we uh, talked about the story of Pilgrim's Progress, that you remain on that narrow way and that you not find the broad road that leads to destruction. He says even in this way that in verse 10, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. He says, even my angels, the angels that see the face of my father, not even the great servant Moses, great because he was close in proximity to God in that he spoke with God, that he saw even the back parts of God himself. Not even he could see the face of God. These great angels who see the face of God, I have given them charge over you. He's saying even my angels in heaven, they have duties to care for my little ones. What great extents the Lord has done to care for you. He said, thinking that way, Sin is a big deal. And if your brother or sister sins, it's a big deal. If your brother and sister sins, even in this age of such um, impersonal, such privacy, well, it's my sin, it's not really affecting you. It's my sin, it's not really affecting you. Jesus is saying, no, not at all. There in the church, there are no private sins. There are no personal sins because your sins affect the body. A little leaven leavens the entire, the whole lump. There are no personal sins. Your private sins, said by one theologian, are the church's business and her judgments when they conform to Scripture are divinely authorized. What does that mean? It means that when you take the attitude of Matthew chapter 7 and you are you have had the log removed from your own eye, the large plank that's keeping you and hindering you and all your vision from helping your brother or your sister when they have that speck of sawdust in their own. You're being that mirror to them that, you, that they are able to see and to turn and to repent from their sin, that they don't continue to live in that sin. That is your loving kindness. It is the care that you would take to remove some very small piece from someone else's eye, that you would not damage their eye, that they would be able to be see, to see clearly again. It is that care that you have that they would not be in sin. You care for them. And if they do not respond to that care, what do you do? You go and you gather a brother or sister together and you say, 
brother, sister, I have brought these before with me. Please hear us. And if they do not, then what do you do? You take them to the church. And if they do not listen to the church, you treat them as someone who has lost, someone who is outside. You put them outside the church. And that is where you get this idea of being whatever you bind and whatever you loose. This is the second time we've heard this. We've heard this in uh, Matthew's gospel, also dealing with the, uh, the keys of the kingdom, binding and loosing. The church has the power to bind and loose. We don't really, I think, live in this reality as Protestants very often this idea of church authority, although it is very important. Church authority is a real thing and it is divinely authorized by Jesus Christ. It is given by Jesus Christ and we must value and we must adhere and exercise church authority and church discipline, even though it is not something that is we see done well in our day. It is that, it is that, it is for the purpose and been given for the purpose of dealing with sin, of loving and shepherding and caring well, that the church would shepherd her people, that they would enter in. It is for the purpose that they would enter into the kingdom, that they would not be found on the broad road that leads to destruction. It has been given For their benefit, it has been given that they may be bound to her, the church. And it has been given that even in those circumstances where those that refuse to repent, they continue to hold on and bear their sin. When they have been brought before the church and they will not let go. That they would even be loosed, that they would be let go and they will be put outside the church. This authority has been given to the church for the purpose that the church may be brought together as one bride, beautiful before the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He gives in conclusion of this chapter, which I'm not going to read. I'm going to paraphrase for you. Please read it word by word. But he gives an illustration of an unmerciful servant. There's a servant who owes the king an amount of money that he could never pay back. And that is the point. He says, uh, I I want to point out that he owed his master, which could have been a king, but he owed his master 10,000 bags of gold. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, Herod's annual tax revenue was 800 talents, which isn't even close to that amount. Not even close. 10,000 was the greatest delineation of Greek numbers that you could have possibly had. There was no word greater than 10,000 in the Greek uh, number, the way they were written out in word form in those those ways. So it's, it's a great, it's a huge number. And it's gold and it's bags of gold, not just pieces of gold. So he's owed this tremendous amount of money. The king comes, the master comes and says, I'm going to throw you into prison because of your debt until it's repaid. And he pleads for mercy. And he says, just give me time. And the master being gracious says, I'm going to forgive your debt. But what happens? The servant goes out. He finds one of his servants that owes him just a small amount of money. And the servant pleads for his grace and mercy and time to pay. And he says, no, I'm not giving you time to pay. Go to prison with you. Well, the master hears how his servant who had been forgiven so much acts wickedly. 
and how he has no patience and no grace for his servant who owed him just so little, even when he had been forgiven so much. And he's at the end of the chapter, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister in your heart. Brothers and sisters, that wicked servant that would not forgive, the servant who owed just a little bit, he goes to prison until he can pay back every penny of what he owed to the master. I've already told you there was no way he could pay back that money. He will be in prison forever. It's a sobering truth. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. We have been forgiven so much. We must forgive. We must love. We must have the care of Matthew 7 for one another to pluck the smallest pieces of sawdust from each other's eyes. We must forgive when we are sinned against because we have been forgiven more than we could ever repay. We have been loved far beyond anything that we could possibly imagine because we are loved by the God of the universe in His Son, Jesus Christ, who has called us sons and daughters. We are His And in order to be His, we have been forgiven so much. So we are loved. So now we must forgive those of us that are around. So this is a wonderful reminder of the love of God, who we are as his little ones, who we should be as the church. Take some time this week going over and meditating upon these passages and these words, worshiping your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for loving us, for being the good shepherd, for coming and finding us when we were lost, for bringing us home. Lord, I pray for Neely's Creek and I pray for your church. Lord, you will not lose any of those which have been given to you and we will be together in the kingdom of God, in that great celestial city, in the presence of our master, we will worship and we will sing songs of praise. We will be together. We will feast in the house of Zion with our hearts restored in great anticipation and joy. We pray and we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.